I'll tell you a couple of stories about fraud. She didn't just delete tens of thousands of those emails. She wiped the server clean. What, like with a cloth or something? <laughs> it's no secret that we're going up against some pretty powerful forces that will do and spend whatever it takes to advance a very different vision for America. Personal emails are my personal business. You know, let's release everything. Let's let everybody in America see what I did for four years. When you speak to the public, you say, I turned over everything. That's, for the most part, a direct quote. When you talk to the public, you say, I turned over everything. That's for the, you know, people investigating it to try to figure out. But we turned over everything that was work-related. Every single thing. 90 to 95 percent of and my work-related emails were in the state system. If they wanted to that, see them, they would certainly have been able to do so. You know what? So. That, that, is, that is maybe the tenth time you have cited that figure today. It is. And I have not heard anyone other than you ever cite that figure. Wh who told you that 90 to 95 percent of your emails were, on the state, were in the State Department system? Who told you that? We learned that from the State Department and their analysis of the, of the emails that were already on the system. The Inspector General report found that less than 1%, less than 1% of State Department emails, record emails, were captured. So they give a number of less than 1% and you give a number of 90%. I have uh, absolute confidence that everything that could be in any way uh, connected to work is now in the possession of the uh, State Department. This pile represents the emails that you sent or received about Libya in 2011, from February through December of 2011. This pile represents the emails you sent or received from early 2012 until the day of the attack. There are 795 emails in this pile. We've counted them. There are 67 emails in this pile in 2012. And I'm troubled by what I see here. I can only conclude by your own records that there was a lack of interest in Libya in 2012. What difference at this point does it make? When I think back now to that day and what she knew, you know, it shows me a lot about her character that she would choose in that moment to basically perpetuate what she knew was untrue. This was a fast-moving series of events in the fog of war, and I think most Americans... How, how, how about more generally? Do you, do, you, do you think there's something you can do to get a majority of Americans to believe you're trustworthy? Hi, Hi Secretary Clinton. Would you sign this for me? Sure. What's your name? Um, if you can make it out to Christopher Stevens. I think you know him. Oh, no, just yeah, I'm not going to make it out to yeah. Christopher Stevens. What difference does it make? There it goes, here. Uh, the server contains uh, personal communications from my husband and me. The uh, only time I got on the internet, I did two emails, and I ordered Christmas presents from a reservation. <laughs> Otherwise, I found people said embarrassing things on emails. I didn't want to be one of them. <laughs> I mean... And how many angels dance on the head of a pin? I have, I, I have, uh, I have really uh, nothing to, uh, I mean, how do you answer that? I feel sorry sometimes for the young people who, you know, believe this, uh, they don't do their own research. I am so sick, I am so sick of the Sanders campaign lying about this. Do you think New York State should recognize gay marriage? No. No. Okay. I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. I do not support gay marriage. It really is great how long you've supported gay marriage. Yes. I, I could have supported it sooner. Well, you did it pretty soon. Yeah. Could have been sooner. Fair point. <laughs> the unborn uh, person uh, doesn't have constitutional rights. Are you saying that a child on its due date, just hours before delivery, still has no constitutional rights? Under our law, that is the case. I 
was a Goldwater girl. I'm very proud that I was a Goldwater girl. Goldwater was against the 64 Civil Rights Act. 40,000 people, half of them Negroes, demonstrate against Goldwater. I am compelled to urge uh, Negroes and all people of good world to vote against him. His election would be a tragedy and certainly suicidal almost for the nation and the world. He's a very um, arrogant um, person to deal with, um, which I think is a combination of this vision of Russia and some fundamental insecurity. I could have told him he was a KGB agent. By definition, he doesn't have a soul. I mean, this is a waste of time, right? Как минимум, государственный деятель должен иметь голову. Mrs. Clinton has never been too graceful in her statements. When people push boundaries too far, it's not because they are strong. I remember landing under sniper fire. There was supposed to be some kind of a greeting ceremony at the airport, but instead we just ran with our heads down to get into the vehicles. Her arrival in Bosnia was not quite as dramatic as Clinton put it. Good to see you. Once again, her memory doesn't match our videotape. She and her daughter Chelsea lingered on the tarmac to greet U.S. military officials. Took photos. There was the group of seventh graders on the tarmac too. And then Senator Clinton walked to the armored vehicle where she did eventually dock and enter. During the parade in which she participated, her campaign roped off reporters so they wouldn't interfere with the candidate. Memory should always match the videotape. I have been a critic of NAFTA from the very beginning. I think that uh, uh, NAFTA is proving its worth. It was one of the highlights of President Clinton's first term, passage of the North American Free Trade Agreement, also known as NAFTA. Critic blame NAFTA for the loss of manufacturing jobs in industrial states including Ohio and Pennsylvania. Hillary Clinton helped get NAFTA approved. She held at least five meetings to strategize about how to win congressional approval. She helped the White House block opposition from labor and environmental groups and she was the featured speaker at a crucial meeting. Participants in that event said, quote, her remarks were totally pro-NAFTA. Was NAFTA a mistake? NAFTA was a mistake to the extent that it did not deliver on what we had hoped it would. Your opponents are saying that that's really part of a larger pattern with you, that you often avoid taking firm positions on controversial issues. Mm -hmm. um, they are going to people showing videos of Donald Trump insulting Islam and Muslims in order to recruit more radical jihadists. The fact checkers have said that she was wrong. All my grandparents, you know, came uh, over here and... Turns out only one was an immigrant, three were not. And then frankly, there are those who are saying the best thing that could happen to us is be attacked by somebody. <laughs> you know, just bring it on because that would unify us, it would legitimize the regime. That's the reason I say if anybody's going to do it, we ought to do it because we have the capability of doing it. You know, we're not going to give anything up, and in fact, we're going to provoke an attack because then um, we will be in power for as long as anyone can imagine. I represented New York, and I represented New York on 9-11. When we were attacked, where were we attacked? We were attacked in downtown Manhattan, where Wall Street is. I did spend a whole lot of time and effort helping them rebuild. That was good for New York, it was good for the economy, and it was a way to rebuke the terrorists who had attacked our country. 9-11 was bad. I agree with that. It's time for the United States to start thinking of Iraq as a business opportunity. Hi, Secretary Clinton, will you release a transcript of your paid speeches to Goldman Sachs? Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, there's a lot of controversy over the speeches. Just uh, in July, New Hampshire, you told the crowd you, quote, take a backseat to no one when it comes to progressive values. I take a backseat to no one when you look at my record and standing up and fighting for progressive values. Last month in Ohio, you said you plead guilty to, quote, being kind of moderate and center. Do you change your political identity based on who you're talking to? No. I think that, uh, like most people that I know, I have a range of views, but they are rooted in my values and my experience. You know, I get accused of being kind of moderate and center. I plead guilty. Just for the record, are you a progressive or are you a moderate? I'm a progressive. I represented Wall Street as a senator from New York, and I went to Wall Street 
in December of 2007, before the big crash that we had, and I basically said, cut it out. Quit foreclosing on homes. Quit engaging in these kinds of speculative behaviors. Now, who's exactly to blame for the housing crisis? And I think there's plenty of uh, blame to go around. Home buyers who paid extra fees to avoid documenting their income should have known they were getting in over their heads. Are you a progressive or are you a moderate? I'm a progressive. Of course we have to deal with the problem that the banks are still too big to fail. We can never let the American taxpayer and middle class families ever have to bail out the kind of speculative behavior that we saw. But we also have to worry about some of the other players. AIG, a big insurance company, Lehman Brothers, an investment bank. There's this whole area called shadow banking. That's where the experts tell me the next potential problem could come from. You're against same-sex marriage, now you're for it. You defended President Obama's immigration policies, now you say they're too harsh. You supported his trade deal dozens of times. You even called it the gold standard. Now, suddenly, last week, you're against it. Will you say anything to get elected? Well, actually, I have been very consistent over the course of my entire life. Time and time again, you hear one thing in speeches, and then you see a campaign that has the worst kind of tactics, reminiscent of the same sort of Republican attacks on Democrats. Well, I am here to say that it is not only wrong, but it is undermining core democratic principles. Since when do Democrats attack one another on universal health care? I have looked at, I've looked at the legislation that Senator Sanders has proposed, and basically he does eliminate the Affordable Care Act, eliminates private insurance, eliminates Medicare, eliminates Medicaid, TRICARE, Children's Health Insurance Program. This is, this is what drives people crazy. It drives them crazy. You know, why not just come out and lay it out? This is what makes people distrust not just these politicians, but Washington, but the administration, but anybody who even raises their hand and testifies under oath, believing you're not being straight with me. In conclusion, Congress is supposed to provide oversight. The voters are supposed to provide oversight. And you are supposed to provide oversight. That's why you have special liberties, and that's why you have special protections. Uh, I am not surprised that the President of the United States called this a phony scandal. I'm not surprised that Secretary Clinton asked, what difference does it make? I'm not even surprised that Jay Carney said Benghazi happened a long time ago. The Clintons fired the White House Travel Office employees, allowing their wealthy Hollywood friends to take over the lucrative travel business. This led to investigations by the FBI, DOJ, GAO, Oversight Committee, and the Whitewater Independent Council. The Clintons claimed the firings were due to financial misdeeds, but the employees were cleared on all counts. Hillary Clinton allegedly played a central role in the firings, yet in her sworn testimony, she claimed she was not involved. The Independent Council found this to be factually inaccurate and that she made factually false statements. The Clintons were forced to remove their friends and reinstate the previous employees. Vince Foster, the longtime friend and companion of Hillary Clinton, was significantly involved in several Clinton scandals. Due to the strange circumstances surrounding his death in 1993, an investigation ensued. Before the police arrived, Clinton staffers illegally removed boxes of documents on Whitewater and presumably Travelgate and other sensitive issues. President Clinton put his wife in charge of the most expensive program in the country. There was a national outrage that the unelected, unqualified First Lady was going to design America's health care system. In a 1993 interview, Hillary Clinton admitted, I am not an expert on health care. I'm not somebody who has studied it. Hillary Clinton kept the Presidential Task Force on National Health Care Reform shrouded in such secrecy that a federal judge threatened to hold the administration in contempt. Two years later, the health care plan was a 1,342-page nightmare, including gatekeepers, health alliances, purchasing cooperatives, new and higher taxes, and restrictions on choosing doctors. Physicians, hospitals, large and small businesses, insurance companies, Democrats, Republicans, and the general public rejected the program, and it failed disastrously. 
The General Accounting Office put a price tag of $32 million on Hillary Clinton's health care fiasco. For dishonesty, Hillary Clinton and others were fined $450,000. Court costs to taxpayers were $725,000. In 1996, with Hillary Care fresh in their minds, Americans voted both the Senate and the House into Republican hands for the first time in over four decades. In 1994, President Clinton's Attorney General Janet Reno initiated an investigation focusing on fraud accusations against the Clintons regarding their real estate venture, Whitewater Development Corporation, co-owned with their friends Jim and Susan McDougall. Hillary Clinton was the central figure, and the probe revealed pervasive conflicts of interest between the Rose Law Firm, where Hillary Clinton was partner, and its client, Madison Guarantee, owned by Clinton business partner, Jim McDougall. Hillary Clinton claimed billing records, subpoenaed and critical to the investigation, were lost. It is presumed they were stolen from Vince Foster's office the night he died. 19 months later, following the Clinton's acquittal, many of the missing records reappeared in the Clinton's residence. As they were covered with Hillary Clinton's fingerprints, she fell under suspicion of obstruction of justice. Their business partner, Susan McDougall, refused to testify against the Clintons, assuring they were not charged. Susan McDougall went to prison for her silence, but was pardoned by President Clinton. 15 Clinton associates were convicted of 40 federal crimes related to Whitewater. The Independent Counsel's report highlighted the president's abundant and calculating lies under oath, obstruction of justice, and abuse of power. During this case, many other alleged abuses were uncovered. The four and a half year expanded investigation cost taxpayers $145 million. Hillary Clinton's trades in cattle futures raised suspicions of improprieties as her very first trade of $5,000 quickly turned into over $490,000. She refused to release her tax returns for the years in question. Hillary Clinton insisted that she made all the investment decisions herself. The investigation proved her trades were actually placed by her friend James Blair through the brokerage firm Refco. James Blair was outside counsel for Tyson Foods, the largest employer in Arkansas, which is state regulated. The perception was Mrs. Clinton received preferential treatment and incredible financial returns as a way to garner favor with her husband, then governor of Arkansas. Refco was investigated and paid the largest fines in the history of the exchange. The Clinton administration improperly requested and received FBI background reports on 900 Republican officials. Hillary Clinton allegedly initiated the request to add data to her enemies list, leading to three separate investigations in 1996. In testimony, the White House Personnel Security Director refused to name Hillary Clinton as the source of the request, and he was forced to resign. Hillary Clinton claimed she was guiltless and was called a congenital liar in the New York Times. The fund was established so individuals or companies hoping to garner favor with the president could help pay the Clintons' endless legal bills. In 1996, the Justice Department investigated campaign fundraising abuses and cover-ups by the Clintons in connection with an effort by China to influence administration policies. In violation of U.S. law, Agents for the Chinese government and military funneled millions into President Clinton's re-election campaign, the Clinton Legal Defense Fund, and the DNC. The DOJ's report stated, a pattern of events suggests a level of knowledge within the White House, including the President's and First Lady's offices, concerning the injection of foreign funds into the re-election effort. The Clintons were accused of using the IRS to harass their enemies, 
including Republican politicians, the White House Travel Office, the NRA, Judicial Watch, the Heritage Foundation, and other conservative organizations. A senior IRS official admitted that Clinton opponents were singled out for tax audits. Also audited were Bill Clinton's female accusers, including Jennifer Flowers, Paula Jones, Juanita Broderick, and Elizabeth Ward Grayson. As he was leaving office in January 2001, President Clinton pardoned 450 people for crimes ranging from cocaine trafficking to kidnapping and terrorism. Several pardons personally benefited Hillary Clinton and were investigated for direct ties to her New York Senate bid. Mark Rich, a billionaire fugitive, owed the government over $160 million and was charged with tax evasion, wire fraud, racketeering, and trading with Iran. Rich's ex-wife, Denise Rich, a close friend of the Clintons, donated over $600,000 to the Clinton Presidential Library just prior to the pardon. Mrs. Rich also gave $14,000 to the Clinton Legal Defense Fund and $135,000 to Hillary Clinton's Senate campaign. The New Square Four were elders of a Republican voting Hasidic community convicted of defrauding the government of millions of dollars. Candidate Clinton met with their grand rabbi. Hillary Clinton received their votes and the New Square Four received their pardons. Hillary Clinton claimed, I did not play any role whatsoever in the pardons. Hillary Clinton's brother, lawyer Hugh Rodham, charged high fees to use his family influence to obtain presidential pardons. Carlos Vignali, a Los Angeles drug lord, paid Rodham over $500,000 and his sentence for cocaine trafficking was commuted. Alman Braswell, a scam artist, paid Rodham over $250,000 and was pardoned for defrauding senior citizens of millions of dollars. Fighting for Puerto Rican independence, the FALN exploded 138 bombs in New York City, Chicago, and Puerto Rico. During a 10-year reign of terror, 13 innocent people were killed and over 80 were maimed. New York City Councilman Jose Rivera met with Hillary Clinton proposing pardons for FALN members in return for Puerto Rican support in her Senate race. Two days later, President Clinton pardoned 16 FALN terrorists. These pardons were condemned by Democrats and Republicans, the House and Senate, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and the Fraternal Order of Police. Another probe into Clinton wrongdoing ensued. When Congress requested additional information, President Clinton claimed executive privilege, preventing anyone involved with the pardons from testifying. Hillary Clinton claimed no involvement in or prior knowledge of the decision. Former Democratic President Jimmy Carter called these shameless pardons disgraceful. The largest political fundraiser in U.S. history became the largest election fraud in history. In the year 2000, the fundraiser for Hillary Clinton's New York Senate race was attended by 1,300 people, including the Hollywood elite and the Democratic leadership. In violation of federal election statutes, an individual, Peter Paul, financed the entire event. Peter Paul was also a convicted cocaine trafficker. In violation, Hillary Clinton was involved with the solicitation of funds and the coordination of the gala. In violation, Hillary Clinton requested in writing an additional $150,000 from Peter Paul in untraceable securities. The Clinton campaign's filings with the Federal Elections Committee stated the event only cost $500,000. The actual price tag was $1.5 million. Senator Clinton was fined over $50,000 for purposely underreporting the cost of the event. In another campaign finance fraud, Hillary Clinton ignored FBI warnings and accepted over $900,000 from scam artist and felon Norman Sue. Hillary Clinton's Senate tenure was undistinguished. In seven years, she introduced only three minor bills, which became law. 
including the naming of a post office. She helped secure millions in federal assistance for a New York developer. Ethics questions arose when the businessman donated over $120,000 to the Clinton Foundation. Senator Clinton did not support English as the official language of the United States government, and she enthusiastically voted for the Iraq War Resolution. Hillary Clinton ignored Senate rules and reporting requirements for the hiring of staff and non-paid fellows, breaking the Senate Code of Official Conduct and hiding multiple conflicts of interest. She was investigated by the Senate Select Committee on Ethics. Hillary Clinton's long history of campaign finance abuses continued. Jeffrey Thompson and other fundraising bundlers for her failed 2008 presidential campaign pled guilty to conspiracy and campaign finance law violations. In the primaries, Democrats nominated the little-known junior Senator Obama over the well-known, scandal-ridden Hillary Clinton. In 2009, President Obama nominated Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. In 2014, the State Department spokesperson was asked to identify one tangible achievement from Hillary Clinton's four years as Secretary of State. She responded, I am certain those who were here at the time, who worked hard on that effort, could point out one. Secretary Clinton's tenure had no signature doctrine or diplomatic breakthrough. It was, however, four more years of scandals. The Clinton State Department wasted $80 million on a U.S. consulate in northern Afghanistan, which will never be completed. Under Clinton's name, the Foreign Service gathered details on foreign diplomats, our allies and officials of the UN, including internet usernames, email addresses, credit card numbers, fingerprints, frequent flyer account numbers, and work schedules. The Clinton State Department lost approximately $6 billion due to improper filing of contracts. The FBI, CIA, and the DOJ requested that Boko Haram be designated as a terrorist group so the agencies could pursue them. Secretary Clinton declined, and the group continued its reign of terror, including the kidnapping of 300 schoolgirls in Nigeria. A special investigator for the State Department claims probes into illegal acts by the Diplomatic Security Service and ambassadors were influenced, manipulated, or simply called off under Hillary Clinton. These include sexual assaults by State Department security officials in Beirut, endemic engagement of prostitutes by Hillary Clinton's security detail, drug use by State Department contractors in Baghdad, solicitation of child male prostitutes by U.S. Ambassador to Belgium. Secretary Clinton's spokesperson claimed Hillary Clinton had no knowledge of any of the scandals in her State Department. We learned of it from the media and don't know anything beyond what's been reported. The United States mission in Benghazi, Libya was attacked on September 11, 2012. As Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State at the time, she is at the heart of the cover-up investigation. When she finally testified to Congress four months after the attack, she famously stated, the fact is we had four dead Americans. Was it because of a protest? Or was it because guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? Hillary Clinton testified that she submitted all documents requested by Congress. 20 months later, and only through a Freedom of Information Act request, 41 new documents were released including changes to Ambassador Susan Rice's talking points. More documents are still being withheld. The Presidential Records Act allows restricted access to documents for 12 years after leaving office. Now, 14 years later, 
the Clintons are still withholding thousands of records from the public. Over 300 Freedom of Information Act requests have been ignored, suggesting more damaging revelations about the Clintons. It is difficult to separate the Clintons' personal and political financial ventures from those of the Clinton Foundation. The New York Times expose on the Clinton Foundation details moral and fiscal chaos, shameless fundraising, and calls it mired in conflicts of interest. Run by old Clinton friends, it has been grossly mismanaged and despite enormous donations, ran multi-million dollar deficits. Already rife with conflicts of interest, the Foundation's offices are now shared by the Hillary Clinton presidential campaign. Americans can give $2,300 to presidential candidates, but there are no limits on donations to foundations. Hillary Clinton cannot legally accept campaign donations from foreigners, but no restrictions apply to foundations. Secretary of State Clinton traveled to Moscow and pressed the Russian government to purchase planes from Boeing. Two months later, contract in hand, Boeing donated $900,000 to the Clinton Foundation. The foundation support from foreign interests hoping to influence U.S. policy is of grave concern. Foreign donations to the foundation increased by 70% when Hillary Clinton ran for president in 2008. Saudi Arabia has financed terrorists, has an abysmal women's rights record, and punishes homosexuality by death. And yet, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is one of the largest supporters of the Clinton Foundation. In a Clinton co-presidency, every large donation could raise suspicions of improprieties or influence peddling and lead to non-stop investigations. Great story here for anybody willing to find it and write about it and explain it is this vast right-wing conspiracy. That it's no secret that we're going up against some pretty powerful forces that will do and spend whatever it takes to advance a very different vision for America. running for President of the United States. The people want to know Hillary. The Hillary that I knew back here in Arkansas. When she was in the Benghazi hearings, when she said, what difference does it make? They're dead. What difference at this point does it make? That's the Hillary I know. We came, we saw, he died. <laughs> Hi, Secretary Clinton. Would you sign this for me? Sure. What's your name? Um, if you can make it out to Christopher Stevens. I think you know him. Yeah, I'm not going to make it out to Chris Stevens. What difference does it make? Here it goes. Here. Yep. Senator Clinton has extraordinary ability to obfuscate, uh, refuse to answer questions, avoid uh, confrontations, and uh, up until now has been given a pass on it. A story in the New York Times talking about why Senator Clinton voted this way, because I think some people were surprised by it. And her advisor said that she voted yes because she was moving from primary mode to general election mode. Primary mode versus general election mode? How about tell the truth mode? How about we say the same thing in the primary that we say in the general election? We know that Hillary's an insecure person. Secure people don't lie. They don't lie inveterately the way she does. Hillary Clinton points to her time in the White House as a large part of her qualification for the job as president. 
but most of the news media has conveniently forgotten that her time as first lady was mired in controversy. The core of the controversy is how truthful Mrs. Clinton has been in answering questions, sometimes under oath, about Whitewater and other matters. She was the first first lady to come under criminal investigation. In both Little Rock and Washington, D.C., she was plagued by numerous scandals. I finally parted company with Hillary Clinton when I saw how she was using private detectives to investigate the women who were linked to her husband. Not to change him, not to reform him, not to make him a better person, but to cow the women into silence so that he could get elected president. I do not want that woman controlling the IRS or the DEA or the NSA or the FBI or the CIA. Not in a democracy, I don't. One thing about Hillary, they were just a good timing guy. But Hillary, she's an animal. Hillary is the one that I promise you, she pulls the strings. She pulled him in Arkansas. She pulled him in the White House when she was there as the first lady. And my God, if she gets to be president, Take a deep breath and relax and just, you know, sit back because here they come again. We're going to have to just ride through this as we have so many of these other um, false accusations.